If you have your Bible, let me encourage you to turn to Galatians 5. That's where we've been starting off each week for the past several weeks, and we'll continue uh, for the next several weeks to come, looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, reminding ourselves that this is not something we produce in ourselves. It's not something that we do. It's not a checklist that we go through and, and mark off, okay, I've done love, I've done peace, I've done patience, I've done joy. It's that we allow God to work in us so that our lives exhibit these qualities in greater and greater amounts as God works within us to do it. It is not something we do on our own. It's something that God does within us. And today... Um, and next week, too, kind of go hand in hand, and that's the issue of kindness. So let's see, uh, just reminding ourselves what Galatians 5, 22, and 23 uh, tell us. It tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Let's pray. Father, it is easy for us to think that we have got things straightened out in our lives, that we are uh, exactly where we need to be, but Father, you remind us that you still have work to do in our hearts. I pray that we would be humble uh, in our attitude toward your word today, that it would work within us the desired effect that you would want it to have. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, If I had to pick a fast food restaurant that is my favorite, uh, it would have to be Chick-fil-A. I don't know if that's you too. Uh, I love Chick-fil-A. I love their food. But the thing that I love the most about Chick-fil-A isn't their food. It's their service. Um, Chick-fil-A is the most accommodating fast food restaurant you will ever encounter. And I, I will tell you something, and you may not be aware of this or not, and once I found this out... It really hurt my waistline and my pocketbook with Chick-fil-A. I love their fries, but you know, sometimes their fries can be a little soggy and not, not the best. You can actually order your fries well done, and they will be extra crispy when you get them. It takes a little bit longer, but they don't mind, and they're so much better. Uh, and that's what I love about Chick-fil-A, the service that they have. And I don't know if you know the story of Chick-fil-A or not. Truett Cathy, who founded Chick-fil-A, was a strong Christian Man, and he founded the company on the premise that you should treat people the way you would want them to be treated, that you should show kindness to your customers, that you should treat them with the kind of respect that, that makes them feel um, a part of what you're doing. So much so that he encouraged his employees, and to this day, if you go to Chick fil A, this will be the case. If you say thank you, They don't say, you're welcome. They say, my pleasure. Because the act of service, the act of doing for other people, isn't just part of their job, it's part of who they are. He founded this company to believe that that, that God would be pleased if a company exhibited the kind of characteristics that are pleasing to God. Now, they're not a perfect company. I'm not saying that they are a perfect institution because none of us are. But this element of kindness is, is, a, is an element that they have worked really hard at. And it's something that I think we as Christians need to understand. This, understand this concept of kindness. What is kindness? What is it to be kind? I'm sure if, if you stopped and you, you thought about it, you could probably picture somebody in your mind who you would say is a kind person. But what is Kindness. Jerry Bridges, the the late Christian author, defined kindness as a sincere desire for the happiness of other people. Now, if that's kindness, a lot of us aren't very kind. We like it when all of us do well, but what if we aren't doing well and somebody else does well? Sometimes we get not kind, but jealous. We get frustrated at those kind of things. Uh, If you go to Webster's and look up the dictionary definition of kindness, it will define it, as only Webster can, as a state of being of a sympathetic or helpful nature or as an attitude characterized by sympathy. That helps us a whole lot, doesn't it? See, Christian kindness, which is what we need to be concerned about, what the fruit of the Spirit is, Christian kindness is the work of the Holy Spirit within us to cause us 
to desire the good of another person. That's Christian kindness. It is the work of the Holy Spirit within us to to change us so that we desire the good of other people, the good of another person. That's Christian kindness. So today I want us to look at some principles for understanding kindness and then look at how we can actually um, develop kindness by God's help in our lives. So the first principle for understanding kindness, and this is a biggie for all of these, but particularly for kindness, is that God is the source of true kindness. God is the source of true kindness. Just like love, just like joy, just like peace, just like patience, we define all of these characteristics, all of the the elements of the fruit of the Spirit, we define them not by how we perceive them and, and feel and our subjective experience. We define them by the reality of who God is. We look at God and and the way God operates and that becomes the definition, the standard by which we understand these characteristics. The Bible uses a lot of words related to kindness. One that is often in some of the older translations is the word loving kindness. It's actually a translation of several uh, different uh, words at different places, but the main one is the idea of God's outpouring of His love unconditionally to his people. God's loving kindness. Titus, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, gives us a hint of what this is all about. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You want to define kindness? It's God's act of saving us. That's God's kindness. That becomes the definition of kindness. And if we go back to say that Christian kindness is deliberately desiring the good of another person, that's exactly what God did. He looked at us in our state of sin and spiritual emptiness and transgression against Him. He looked at us and in His love and kindness toward us, he acted to save us for our own good. That's kindness. We didn't deserve it. We didn't do anything to deserve it. We couldn't do anything to deserve it. And God did it anyway. So God is the source of true kindness. Because of that, we can show kindness. God shows us kindness, therefore we can show that same kind of kindness to other people. And in many ways, we become a conduit for kindness. We take the kindness that we have received from God, and that changes us to where we then go out and we show kindness to other people. The second principle for kindness is that true kindness is possible. Possible in our lives. Possible for us. Possible that we can do it. Not in our own strength, but God wants us to be kind. So much so that he commands us to be kind. God's not going to command something he doesn't expect us to be able to do with his help. Ephesians 4.32 is one of those verses of scripture that I truly believe that if we just spent the rest of our lives trying to live out this verse would radically change so much of who we are. Ephesians 4.32, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Be kind to one another. Just read it again. Be kind to one another. That's a command. Not feel kind, be kind. Something that we do. So, how do we live this out? What does kindness like this look like? First of all, kindness like this is practiced. It is practiced. Remember it said, be kind to one another. The Bible doesn't say things just to be saying them. It says them very intentionally. It could have just said, be kind. And we could be kind to ourselves. Right? We live in a world that believes, be kind to yourself. 
Do for yourself. Look out for number one. But that's not what it says. It says be kind to one another. Be kind to each other. You can be kind to yourself and mean as a snake to somebody else. And we wouldn't be doing what God wants us to do at that point. He wants us to be kind to each other. It is to be practiced. We can't just say that we're kind people. We actually have to show it. To show kindness is the only way to prove if you are kind or not. Now, there's a verse, and we're actually going to look at it in greater detail next week on the issue of goodness, but it, but it helps us to grasp this idea of kindness. It's Galatians 6.10. It says, So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I want you to notice just one thing in that verse today, and like I said, we'll look at it in greater detail next week. It tells us to do good, to be kind, to do good to everyone, but especially to those who are of the household of faith, to our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the one another of Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another. Now, we need to be kind to everybody, but kindness starts at home. And for the Christian, what's home? Life in the church. Be kind to your brothers and sisters in Christ. I can say this with utmost confidence and sincerity. The nicest, kindest things that have ever been said or done for me have been done by my brothers and sisters in Christ. But I can also say with equal genuineness that the meanest and nastiest things that have ever been said or done to me have been done to me by my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now the question then is, how is that so? If we're being kind to one another, that shouldn't be the case. James kind of pictures this when it comes to the issue of the mouth. James 3.10, he says, From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. See, kindness starts at home. It's to be practiced, to be lived out. And there are three areas that so often... In, in, in our lives, and I include myself in this because you know we all struggle in these areas. Three areas that are true kindness killers amongst the church, amongst the people of God. I've talked to a lot of lost people in my lifetime, and one of the things that I hear is a common theme is people who have been hurt and mistreated by so-called Christians. Uh, I, I met a lady several years ago, long before we ever came to Denmark, Um, So you don't have to think I'm talking about anybody around here because I'm not. Um, She refused to come to the church where I was serving at because her neighbor was a member of our church, my church at the time. And that broke my heart because she said, I know what she's really like and she's not like the person she is on Sunday. So these kindness killers really create problems. Here, here's three of them, and, and this goes from preaching to meddling, so you know, we can go ahead and have an altar call if we need to afterwards. If this hits you too hard, I'm sorry, but I'm not. Okay, the first is gossip. You may say, preacher, I'm not a gossip. It takes two people to gossip. One person to tell it, and one person to hear it. You may say, well, I don't spread it. But you listen. If you listen, you're just as guilty as the person who spreads it. It'll kill kindness. Just think about it. I mean, just imagine for a second there's somebody who's really struggling with something, and they come and they just share your heart, their heart to you, and, and they tell you what's going on, and then you go around and you start telling to everybody, and they didn't want everybody else knowing it yet because it was such a personal, sensitive thing. What are they going to think about you if that's what happens? Are they going to trust you again? No. You've killed any chance of kindness in that relationship. So gossip is a deadly, deadly thing. Deadly, deadly thing. The second one, complaining. None of us complain, do we? You know, this, this sounds crazy, but it's true. Sometimes the only way you can get some people to agree with you is to complain about something. You ever met somebody like that? They're always complaining about something. They are just never happy. 
So if you start complaining, they'll, they'll go along with you because they like complaining. Complaining will kill kindness. The third one is deception. Deception. This is, this is being one thing to somebody's face and another thing behind their back. This is, this is just lying to people about who you really are. Gossip, complaining, and deception will kill kindness. Be kind to one another. If we're being kind, those three things will not be present. See, when we don't show kindness, it ruins our witness for Jesus. You know, I hear people say all the time you know, that some of the hardest people to, to witness to, to share Christ with, are family. And the reason they're the hardest is because they know us and because they've seen us when we've been in those three situations. Gossip, complaining, and deception. That's why it becomes so difficult. They see us at our worst a lot of times. It doesn't mean we put on a fake front, but it means that we live a genuine life. Marked by kindness. And when we do that, we see those three things for what they really are as deadly to the health of our own souls. Okay, so it's to be practiced, to be lived out. The second thing about kindness is that it's shaped by God's heart. Be kind to one another. And then it tells us they're tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Two marks of the heart of God that I think we need to remember is that God is tender-hearted. That word translated tender-hearted is also translated in other places as compassionate. It's the same root word that's used when it speaks of Jesus when he saw the crowds and it says he had compassion on them. It's the idea of being so deeply moved that there is a physical reaction. You are physically moved with compassion for the other person. See, most of us, when we became Christians, we start off tender-hearted, compassionate, with a desire to please God. We start off so eager, our hearts just break for the things we see around us, and we want to see God do great things. We start off that way, but, but for some reason, over time, some people get cold-hearted, by the troubles of life. They stop being compassionate. They stop being tender-hearted. Uh, this was an area I struggled with for a very long time. And if one area in particular, and this is confession time for me, that was very difficult for me is when people would come asking for help. You see, over time, you see it a lot. Not just here, but everywhere. People come, they want help with certain things, they want, you know, a little bit of money, they want whatever. And you hope and pray that they're genuine about it. You hope and pray that they're, they're using it for the right reasons. But I can tell you from experience, I have had situations where people have taken advantage of me. Or they've burned me. They've come and they've asked, they've given a good sob story and they've not been truthful. Happens enough, it starts getting to you a little bit. You start getting a little cold hearted, getting a little skeptical. And the problem is what happens is, is the few bad apples ruin it for everybody else. We need to be very careful not to let that happen in our lives. That, that the things that move us, the things that stir us up, the things that, that bring us to a point of, of just heartfelt reaction should be the same things that stir God up. Let me challenge you to go to go home and take your Bible and study this issue of compassion. Look in the Gospels particularly. Look at when it said Jesus had compassion. And here are just a few of the things that really stirred Jesus up that I hope will begin to stir us up as well. People who were lost. Sinners. You know, instead of pointing a finger and saying they ought not do that, it moved Jesus with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. It caused him to see, because he knew what was really there as God in the flesh. He knew their hearts. It should stir us up as well. It should cause us to have a reaction. Instead of being judgmental about what people are doing, it should break our hearts to say how awful that they are lost and trapped. And it should motivate us to be kind to them. 
Another was physical needs. Physical needs. When Jesus saw the people were hungry, what happened? He had compassion on them and fed them. He had compassion for them. Then those also who were at the margins of society and could not help themselves. People who were in just a bad situation. Jesus had compassion on them. People who had been oppressed, people who were being taken advantage of, people who had been sold a bad bill of goods by life. Jesus had compassion on them. One of the things that we need to remember in our lives, whenever we come in contact with somebody, that they are probably going through something that we don't even begin to understand. And as a result, we need to remember that there but by the grace of God go we. We may not be dealing with what they're dealing with, but we could be dealing with what they're dealing with if it wasn't for God's work in our lives to keep us from dealing with it. And we need to be kind to those people. We don't need to fuss at them. Why fuss at a blind person for what they can't see? Instead, we need to show kindness and be compassionate, tender-hearted. See, I want us to understand that there are tremendous needs around us. Tremendous needs around us. And true kindness is not meeting a need so it will go away. True kindness is stepping into that situation and doing what only God through us can do, which is point that person to Jesus. And we do that by being compassionate, by being tender-hearted, by letting God work within us. But compassion or kindness is also marked by forgiveness. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. See, a lot of times we get cold-hearted because of the, the, the things that have burned us in the past, but sometimes we get cold-hearted because we're holding on to something that we just can't let go of. Somebody hurt us, somebody caused us pain, and as a result, we end up nursing that hurt to where it begins to sap all the spiritual life, all the spiritual vitality out of us. And we end up cold and lifeless. What would we do if God treated us the way so many times we treat other people? What would, what would it be like for us if God treated us exactly the way sometimes we treat other people. But yet we're, we know that God doesn't treat us that way. God forgives us in Christ. See, forgiveness is not letting that person or that thing hurt us any longer. It's treating that person with kindness because we have been forgiven. It's just letting go. That's true forgiveness. You can't spend any amount of time with people and not have somebody hurt you. Not have somebody do something to you that's going to cause you pain, cause you grief. And if we don't forgive, if we don't let go of whatever that may be, eventually it's going to hurt us. And to be kind to people, we have to forgive them. We cannot hold on to these things and think that we can be kind in spite of them. Because you know what happens? What it is, if you're, if you're kind to somebody, quote unquote kind, and you're holding on to a grudge, you know what that's called? Lying, being a hypocrite, because you really don't want to be kind to that person. You're just doing it because you feel like you have to. And that's deception. That's one of those kindness killers. See, what would happen to our families, to our marriages, to our churches, to our communities, even our country, if we, as the people of God, lived a life marked by true Christian kindness. So that can only happen when we let God change us from the inside out. We can't just leave here and say, you know, I'm going to be kind today. It's God's got to do it in us. The only way we can have a life shaped by God's heart is if God's living within us, changing us, molding us, shaping us, making us new. Only then can we be kind the way that pleases God. The simplest definition of kindness 
is love in action. It's loving somebody because God loves them. It's loving somebody because God loved you and living that out as God would see fit. So we speak so often of how we ought to love one another. Kindness is how we show it. It's by doing deliberate good for another person. It's by not holding on to things. It's not, by, it's not manipulating to get our way. It's not doing so that people will praise us and applaud us. It's doing because God has done everything for us. And so we live differently. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And Scripture tells us, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another just as in Christ God forgave you. The invitation today is to be in a position where you can let God use you to show true kindness. Maybe there's somebody in your life, maybe there's a person you know that you need to show them kindness. Cut them a little slack, help them out a little bit, do whatever it is that God would have you to do to do good for that person. Do deliberate good for that person, to put love in action. Let that be what you seek to do for God's glory this week. It's tough. It's not something we do in our own strength. It's only God doing it through us that it can happen. And when we do that, it would literally change the world. One simple act of kindness at a time will change the world for God's glory and God's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, help us to look to you as the source of true kindness. And as you work within us, know that kindness truly is possible. It is possible because of what you've done for us. And Lord, it's not easy. Lord, it's in fact the most difficult thing many of us will ever do. But Lord, it's the only way we can please you in our relationships with one another is if we are kind to one another. Starting here and then moving out to all people, loving as you would have us to love them, doing deliberate good for other people. Lord, I just pray right now that during this time of invitation that we would respond to your call upon our lives, whatever it might be. Wherever you are leading us, Father, we pray that we would answer obediently, faithfully, that we would not allow the things of this world to distract us from focusing upon you as we rest in your powerful, loving embrace, seeking to serve and to please you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our song of response, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. May we stand?
thank you for being here today, and I pray that as you go, uh, whatever your plans may be for this holiday, that you will show kindness wherever you are. And remember uh, that your ultimate allegiance, as much as we love living where we live, our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus. And so whatever you do, whatever you say, you do as a representative of him. And keep that in mind in your celebrations for the 4th of July. Uh, But pray uh, for our country, pray for our leaders, pray uh, that God would do a great work in our midst again. It's not too late. God can still do a great work if we would just humble ourselves and let him move. I want to thank you for being here. As we close today, we want to close with the chorus, The Bond of Love. Um, Matt, we do have some tickets left. If anybody wants to go to Columbia for the uh, Liberty Celebration this afternoon, we're leaving at 2 o'clock, and we do have six tickets left. Okay, six tickets free, no charge. No charge. So if you want to go, just see Sue after the service, and she'll get you signed up. Right. Let's right. sing.